Welcome back to the Around the Block podcast by Coinbase. I'm your co-host, Catherine Wu. And I'm Justin Hart. And today we're actually going to do a follow-up on a two-part series about DAOs. Yeah. So Justin, just a reminder for our listeners, what is a DAO? That is a good question. Um, I would first off say you should probably watch the first episode or listen to it. Uh, we go into DAOs quite in depth. Um, a lot of the high level, what is it? How does it work? Why should we care? Um, I think a quick easy explainer is this stands for a decentralized autonomous organization, kind of a new way for people to socially coordinate through the use of a blockchain smart contract, a token of some form that indicates membership in the DAO and social elements like coordinating on Discord or Twitter or other sort of platforms to achieve some common shared purpose or goal. Yes. And so today's follow on is actually going to be more focused on the day to day operations. Right. So when we say what is it to even work with the DAO for a DAO? Yeah. Um, what does that mean? What does it mean today? What does it mean to get involved? We got a lot of the high level last time with Jesse. Uh, this one, I have a lot of tactical questions like, OK, I know what it means to work for Coinbase or a company. Right. But a DAO, this is a decentralized thing. There's no owner, there's no CEO, there's no like corporate structure, right? So what the heck does it even mean? We're going to be hitting on this quite a lot in the podcast. And it's this idea that decentralization is a buzzword. It mm -hmm. is not binary. Yeah. You are not either decentralized or not decentralized. You're in a spectrum somewhere. And I don't know if we've seen anything that's fully decentralized. That seems very chaotic, very messy. So somewhere there's some trade-offs towards centralization. Some people have some measure of more influence and control somehow for whatever reason, right? Mm -hmm. And there's also like, we probably do have fully centralized things that exist, right? But everything's kind of a spectrum here. Yeah. And so again, with DAOs, how decentralized are they? How decentralized should they be? What is the trade-off when you move totally decentralized versus yeah. totally centralized? Yeah. Well, there's also just like, how much can you uh, automate and to what extent do you just accept that not everything can be automated by software? At the mm -hmm. end of the day, human decisions still do come into play and are really important. So like, how do you build out a fully automated, decentralized organization, but also balancing human decisions? Yeah, there's a, there's a word there, right? In the DAO, it's decentralized autonomous yeah. organization, right? And the autonomous part gives reference to the idea that, hey, if you launch a smart contract, mm -hmm. an application running mm -hmm. on Ethereum, that application will run according to the code, according to the logic that's written into it every time. And in that sense, it's autonomous. It will do that every single time, no matter what. That's the feature of blockchains. So the idea is we have organizations that have code that governs them, and that code is autonomous. It will always run. Mm -hmm. The decentralized aspect says that, oh, that some people have some influence over what functions in that code are called, what things are actually run, right? But the actual code itself never changes. I don't know if that, that's clear at all, but <laughs> that word autonomous is important. Yeah. Yeah. I think I'm in the camp where I just think human decisions are really important still. Like and I think even in a fully mm -hmm. autonomous, fully running organization, I just think it is really hard to take humans out of it. Yep. And the guest that we're bringing on, Kinjal, um, I'm pretty excited because so she started her career off at Fidelity, which fun fact, Fidelity is actually one of the few OGs that got into Bitcoin really actually early. Actually doing some crypto stuff. Yeah, yeah. you remember this. Yeah, um, yeah. And so Kinjal started her career there. Now she's at Blockchain Capital, where she's a full-time investor. But the reason why I actually thought she would be perfect to bring on today is because Kinjal actually, I think, launched a DAO earlier this year. Um, and I'm really excited to ask her about it because from what I can gather, the DAO that she launched called Komarebi is actually an investment DAO, but she also is a full-time investor at a traditional venture capital firm. Blockchain Capital. Yeah. Yep. So I think that tension would be really interesting to tease out. I'm really excited to bring her on and just ask her more about it. Me too. Yeah. I kind of think she's the perfect guest for this. Well, let's dive into the topic of DAOs. Let's get down. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it. You have to. Um, you kind of have to, honestly. We have yeah. to. <laughs> and let's talk to Kinjal Shah. Kendrell, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, guys. Okay. I'm excited to be here. One of the reasons why I was excited to bring you on is because you actually run a DAO. So like, I want to dig into actually your motivations behind doing that, why you chose a DAO structure. So I am a co-founder of Komorebi, which is an investment DAO that's focused on funding female and non-binary founders in crypto. From a day-to-day -day perspective, we're writing you know small angel-sized checks to founders in the space. Um, and we've brought together about 35 members across the ecosystem. So we have investors, you have operators, um, engineers, basically anybody who really aligned with this cause and, and really wanted to contribute um, their time and their resources. 
how, how does somebody become a member of this DAO? Yeah. So for our soft launch, basically how it started off was I was doing female founder office hours this year. And, and I basically got linked up with She256 and Women in Blockchain, which are both organizations in the space that spend a lot of time educating um, and bringing awareness just to, to blockchain and crypto in general. Um, and so we decided to soft launch Komorebi and just started reaching out to folks that we knew would be interested in this um, topic and just allies, I guess. Um, so today we have 35 members and it's relatively closed in the sense that we cannot accept new members until we are formally going out for our next pool of capital. And the reasons that we're being a little bit stricter about that is, is really from a regulatory perspective, trying to minimize risk. Um, but in theory, we would love for this now to be open to anyone and for anyone to be able to contribute capital and join. Um, but we're kind of working towards that goal. Well, as someone who works, you know, your your day job is still at a traditional venture capital fund. What made you want to go the Dow route? Yeah, so it felt natural to choose a structure that that was maybe more collaborative and open to go after this cause because we really felt like there would be a lot of benefits from having an entire community around this. So that's part of the reason we chose a Dow structure. The other reason we chose a Dow structure was that you know, raising a fund comes with a lot of administrative overhead and a lot of cost that launching a DAO does not. <laughs> you know, this is an entirely on-chain run vehicle, which means that we don't have a bank account and all of our capital is basically um, deployed out of USDC. And so there were some, you know, benefits on that for, from that perspective. But I'd say the the last piece that's really important um, is that in a traditional fund, you have LPs or limited partners who are um, giving their capital to GPs or general partners to deploy. And in a investment DAO, it's like everybody is in a limited partner, right? So everyone has a seat at the table, they contribute capital, but they're also saying that they're going to play a role in the investment decisions that we make and how we source and do diligence. And I can go into that a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, does I guess I'd love to know more about the actual distinctions between a traditional venture capital firm and an investment-focused DAO in the sense of like, how how does a DAO make those decisions? How does that differ from an actual VC firm? Um, how do you guys source the deals? Like what's actually fundamentally different when you look at a DAO versus a VC firm? So I would say we break our investment process into four core steps. And I would say this is, this is a sim the same as a venture firm. So we have sourcing, diligencing, making the investment decision, and then supporting our portfolio companies. So here's kind of like each step of the way and how they potentially differ. So at a, at a VC firm, you know, usually you have the analysts or associates or whoever it may be actually going out and sourcing the deals. With an investment DAO, we have our entire DAO. So we have 35 people going out and sourcing deals for us, and they can refer a deal flow. Um, so somewhat similar, but we just have more kind of folks at the table. From a diligence perspective, it's it's still pretty similar. I would say we have some considerations like we cannot um, wire capital to a bank account. So all of our investments have to be made in USDC, but otherwise our diligence process is very similar. Our thesis is very generalist. So, you know, we are investing across the entire crypto space. And yeah, it's, it's you know, pretty much following the same process of how a venture would potentially, venture firm would potentially go in and um, allocate capital. And then at the investment level, this is really where things differ. We effectively have a voting system. So every single member of the DAO is voting on all investment decisions. Um, at a, at a venture firm, you typically just have your general partners, your partners, whatever structure that might look like that makes up the investment committee and are ultimately making that call. Um, and then lastly is support. So we're playing around with a lot of interesting models of how our DAO can um, help support some of our portfolio founders, whether that's you know creating different office hours or different mentorship models or whatever that might look like. But in a um, venture firm, it's likely to be much more formal in the sense that they're doing, you know, recruiting help or marketing help or whatever that might look like. Got it. So it seems like the distinction here is more, uh, well, it's easy for you guys to spin up your fund because you don't have to go through a lot of the sort of paperwork that a venture capital firm has to do. You're more decentralized in the sense of your investment decisions where everybody votes on an investment. Um, and I guess the idea too is you're going to open up membership to be more inclusive to everybody down the road. But at the start, you want yes. it to be a specialized core group of people. You want to kind of demonstrate the value of this DAO to founders. 
So they'd agree to take on your capital and then over time make it more open and inclusive, right? Um, I mean, I actually appreciate that functionally it's not that different from a traditional company. And I and I think that's that's right. And I think that's probably the case for most DAOs, which is that like functionally, there's a lot that translates to what a traditional job and function looks like. Maybe the bigger difference here is just that it's just more uh, inclusive and it's a little bit more focused on like power to the people, right? Like everybody gets a say, power to the people, everyone gets a vote. And obviously, you know, right now you guys have 35 members and that's maybe a small enough number to uh, force a decision on. But as you scale, how do you think about actually, you know, it's impossible to just get 100% participation every single time, right? We've seen that time right. and time again. And I don't think that's going to change with DAOs. So how do you think about that kind of tension between like, A, do you sacrifice efficiency? And B, like, how, as you scale, how do you think about participation rates? It's a great question and and it's definitely a problem. I think there's a lot of conversation around how flat structures equal DAO. And I think the reality is that hierarchies is important, but that at the end of the day, your decisions are being held to the community, right? Like your decisions can be audited by the community. I think that's like the, the clear distinction here. So even with our investment process, we're not expecting 100% participation today, but we are providing pure transparency into our pipeline, into our meetings, into our comp like diligence. So everybody can access that information and feel like they have the ability to kind of speak up. And so I think as we scale the number of members, we're going to start to um, take those four functions that I mentioned and start formalizing them even more. So trying to make it really easy to contribute, but also not overwhelming the community with like tons of stuff to do. I'm actually really curious what you're hearing from founders as far as why they would accept a check from your DAO versus a traditional VC firm. What's the value proposition to them? What are the distinctions that they're looking at? Why would they do that? Yeah, it's a great point. And honestly, we've had amazing reception from founders in the community. I'm I'm just super excited about this. I think there's two clear value props that, that um, founders are seeing. The first is that let's just say you wanted to bring on a number of angels um, and you just don't have necessarily a lot of room in your, in your round. When you bring on Komarabi, it's kind of like getting 35 angels um, and you're getting 35 angels that all are experts in their own little niche, um, which is super beneficial, I think. And just having like that touch point of saying like, Hey, you know, I'm part of Komarabi's portfolio and you're in Komarabi just creates like a great jumping off point. So I think that's the first thing. And then the second thing that we're really trying to develop right now and, and figuring out what this will look like is that we want our um, our portfolio founders to be able to leverage each other as a resource. So have this be like a safe space for female founders in crypto, which doesn't really have a natural spot anywhere else in the community where you can kind of go to another um, founder and just kind of like swap stories and share and get advice, guidance, whatever it might be. So I think both of those elements today are really compelling and we're, we're thinking a lot about how we can make that value prop even stronger. Yeah, I love that point. Right. This is a very awesome sort of, you know, uh, investment focused DAO. What's the landscape of DAOs? <laughs> what are the different types of DAOs that exist and uh, what are you most excited about? Yeah, there are um, there's so many different types of DAOs today. And I would say the, the three or four biggest buckets that I've seen are protocol DAOs. So these are going to be things like Uniswap or Aave. Um, investment DAOs, and then service DAOs. So we're starting to see a lot of DAOs that are specifically focused on like one niche vertical that they want to go after. So Llama DAO, for example, is going after um, treasury diversification and helping DAOs kind of formulate that strategy. Can we maybe zoom in on social DAOs? Because this is maybe like something that's more closer to the metal of like what, what, what the purity of a DAO is. It's really just a way to socially coordinate. So friends with benefits, right? I'm actually a member in that. It's interesting because you basically go out and you, you buy these tokens that are that are kind of governance rights over this DAO, and you have to buy a certain amount of tokens to get membership into this DAO, which is essentially a Discord chat, right? So, I mean, I guess my, my meta question here is like, what are the new interesting things that they're doing? Like, why would you want to be a member of this thing? Um, and like, actually, are you a member of Friends with Benefits? Did you play around with this? I am, yeah. Yeah. So what's your motivation for getting involved? You know, there's this concept of Senius, if you if you guys are familiar with that concept, but it, it's kind of like um, what's like the uh, like drinking water by the cooler spot on the internet. You know, when you when you're in an office and you kind of want to congregate with everybody and like hang out around work, 
And I think FWB just quickly became that for, for Web3. There's just a lot of really interesting folks in there that are building, um, investing, just like sharing ideas. And it kind of cre- became like this creative um, refuge. And so that's kind of where the like impetus for me to join came. And now I really see the value prop of FWB being um, multifold. Like one, I can go there to try to source um, answers to different questions that I have, or just be able to get a feel for like the general pulse of the community and like what people are interested in doing. But I also think they've created a lot of great ways to connect IRL. So they have these like city DAOs that are launching now. So FWB kind of has like sub DAOs across the world that are launching. They host these IRL events. Um, they hosted a few at NFT week that were really fun to go to and just kind of meet some of these people in real life. And they're also thinking a lot around like products and what products might make sense for their community to kind of build out and champion. So yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty neat. One of the things that I really love is once you remove the physical component of community organizing, like how much bigger you can scale from there, mm. right? So like, community organizing generally is is very local focused right because it kind of requires a group of people congregating at the same time in the same place but now that it's kind of all digital you remove that barrier and so actually like one person can be and most people who are in, involved in DAOs are involved in more than one DAO and usually all for different purposes mm-hmm. what's interesting to me maybe I'll play devil's advocate for a moment right because we have the internet which enables people to coordinate and kind of talk to each other across the globe very easily like, what does a DAO structure actually bring to that environment that makes it better or different or able to do new things? Um, I think the obvious answer is it, it lets you kind of coordinate capital. But what other elements does the DAO structure enable you to do beyond that? Or is or is there more to just coordinating capital that's really powerful here? I think it's coordinating capital and the token incentives that you can kind of employ. So coordinating capital is like the first step of saying, OK, we kind of have this shared cap table say and every single member we know is a is a part of this cap table because they've purchased the token or they have the token somehow and then there's all sorts of incentives that you can create to either retaining the community members via this token or incentivizing new members or whatever that might be and then i think the second piece is is really what Catherine was talking about is co- like the community angle where geography is no longer an element anybody can join from anywhere around the world. And as we start to spend more time online, we're seeing a lot more focus on this like, you know, anonymous culture of being able to join any of these communities without having to reveal who you are. I think that's pretty powerful as well. I know that the number one place where a lot of DAOs are organizing is in Actually, it's among different things. It's Discord channels, it's Telegram, it is on various forums like Snapshot, and it's it's really messy, you know, let's be honest. So as someone who actually organizes a DAO, Kindrel, like where do you feel like uh, we're missing in terms of tools and infrastructure to really run a seamless process that doesn't feel really overwhelming for people who want to be involved with just more than one DAO? Today, our our DAO stack, like at least for Komorebi, is very Web2 focused. Like we use Telegram, we use Notion, um, we use Google Docs. Like it's it's just like very straightforward, right? We're just using the tools that we already use for work to collaborate. Uh, and I think what would be really helpful over time is um, a couple of different things. One, being able to like actively view who is contributing and see that in like a space so you understand like who's doing what to um, better understanding how to compensate and reward contributors. So things like coordinate are great tools to kind of better understand this. And then there's a lot of work I think that needs to be done on like the operational side. So we use Gnosis Safe right now to manage our um, capital, but I think it would be great to have better tools for, you know, paying users or expenses that you might have. Like today, all of our expenses are paid via a credit card for for many things and it's really difficult to translate that over to like gnosis safe so these are kind of like nitty-gritty problems but i think the operational side is one that we're going to start to see a lot of solutions come out of um and then i guess the last piece that i would say is you know everybody like you mentioned a lot of people are joining multiple DAOs, and i think we're in this like phase of DAO proliferation where everybody wants to kind of join all these cool ideas and experiments but you quickly realize that you know, you have a number like Dunbar's number of like how many DAOs you can contribute to meaningfully before you start to get um, 
either like stretched thin or you just can't do it. And so I think we need more tools that allow people to kind of like check in and understand what they're supposed to be doing, irrespective of time, you know, zones and and what their, you know, other um, responsibilities are. So switching gears, uh, one of the interesting conversations I've been having a lot with friends in the industry is people thinking about leaving their full-time jobs to go work in Dallas full-time. Um, so future. Future's here. <laughs> the future is here. So I think maybe two-part question for you. Number one, how do people even think about getting involved in working for DAOs? And like, what would that look like for people who maybe like myself, like I'm not a coder, right? I'm not technical. So like, how do I think about getting involved with DAOs and think about my value out there? And secondly, like, do you think, do you see that trend continuing? People, instead of working for one corporation, just spending their time with various different DAOs and that becomes like a full-time thing. I do. Um, I actually, I've been hearing more and more about this from my, my friends as well. And I think the reason that it's so exciting is it, it feels like rather than devoting, you know, a stretch of time to one particular company or project, you kind of agree, you're able to create like a portfolio of projects that you're really excited about and, um, design your, your life accordingly. And right. You can basically design your career and say, these are like the three things I'm really going to double down on. So I definitely think people are kind of going in thinking more and more about like what this could look like full time. That being said, I, we have a long way to go when it comes to onboarding people into the doubt ecosystem. Um, I think it's relatively complex and a little bit like unspoken. Like there's a lot of rules and a lot of like ways to go about it that are, are still somewhat opaque. Typically what I recommend for anybody coming into this space is kind of get oriented around like the social community first. So try to get involved in like the discord or the telegram or whatever it may be, reach out to a few people who you think are um, some of the bigger voices in the space and and get some like one-on-one time with them. And then start to think about like what areas you might want to contribute to. So, you know, as a non-technical contributor, this could mean, um, working on things like uh, treasury diversification, visual like rebranding, creating documentation, education, um, just like protocol improvement proposals and co-writing that with someone. There's there's a lot of different options. And then I think there's some tools that are also really helping folks get more involved. So layer three, for example, is a new project that's basically has like bounties for getting onboarded into a DAO. So you can pick up a bounty and say, I'm going to go do this like very defined task or rabbit hole, which is doing some great work of like getting folks kind of literally down the rabbit hole by teaching them how to use these projects. Um, So I think we're going to start to see more and more onboarding tools as well. It probably depends a lot too on just what type of DAO it is. Um, If you're passionate about a subject, you probably bring something differentiating to the table, or you're just really hungry to learn or help in whatever way exists. So it's got to, yeah, it's got to first start with socially reaching out, connecting with the group, seeing what needs to be done, what areas you align with personally that you would love to get involved with and then kind of going from there. Yeah. I mean, the basic understanding and the basic thing that is done differently with DAOs is that so traditionally in a company, decision making is done behind closed doors and done on like private documents, right? All of a sudden, communities are making decisions in the open. If you want to join a DAO or join a community, sometimes your reasoning actually has to also be stated out in the public. So in a way, it's it's all truly learning in public and making decisions in public. This to me seems like one of the radical shifts, right? Because it is totally transparent. And so the other side of this coin that I'd love to talk about a little bit is, okay, DAOs are doing new things. What are the trade-offs? What are the challenges that they're going to face? How do you manage a DAO over time? Will the community schism and fraction? There's a freeloader problem too. If somebody can be a part of a DAO and kind of reap the benefits of being a part of it, even if they're not actually contributing in a real meaningful way, how do you align contributions to scale with the input and the value they're adding? I guess I have a few ideas. The first is that like, we're starting to experiment with um, token gating or just like token access in general and what that could mean. So potentially you have to show proof of contribution before you get into like a next level of whatever that might look like. So DAOs might start to have like tiers of, you know, contributors and tiers of access. Another idea is that I think airdrops right now have been pretty popular of saying, we're going to go back and like retroactively so, you know, provide some sort of token to our contributors. Um, I think there's a lot of experimentation that needs to be done there as well so that you're truly getting, um, you're truly reaching like your most effective contributors to a particular DAO. 
And then I think like the other piece is that right now there's a lot of DAOs that don't have um, any structure and we're starting to see the need for structure and, and everyone's sort of immediate go-to is that hierarchy means it's going to be a corporate, you know, corporation when in reality, I don't think that's true at all. And, and everybody loves having direction. And so I think um, a lot of DAOs are going to have direction be provided via some sort of um, either delegated governance model or committee esque model. Um, and I think that's going to be really important as well, just to kind of provide shape and, and guidance. I really love that, like with, with DAOs, it's actually a, a way more flexible way of yeah. working, which is that like you get compensated based on your contributions. Everything is open source. Everything is built in the public. And so in a way, it allows you to A, right, like be able to work for different DAOs, but also actually your contribution is directly tied to basically your financial incentives yeah. too, which I think is like, it makes sense in my head. It makes sense. I actually think the nine to five is is in need of getting really it's got, just it's revamped. It's got to be innovated a little bit, right? Yeah. Yeah. Tweaked with. yeah, yeah. Um, th th this is really interesting to me, right? Because we can see all the benefits. It's so, so amazing, right? On the other hand, we're also, in my opinion, going to see how, yeah, these DAOs end up kind of replicating current structures to a degree. Mm -hmm. Not the nine to five workday because I think it's outdated but definitely, oh, organizational structure. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we'll probably end up replicating some of the lessons we've already learned, but we're going to do it in the open. We're going to do it in a brand new blockchain world and we're going to see what it looks like. I completely agree. Have you guys spent time contributing to any particular DAOs? Like, have there been any examples that stood out to you as being, as doing a really good job of managing this? We talk to a lot of them on Coinbase Ventures and we, you know, chat with them about what they're doing. Um, I personally haven't spent too much time in the nitty gritty. Maybe Friends with Benefits is the only one, but... I also feel like we're just so early in the game, right? We're still just yeah. in the, like, what if it's a baseball game, we're in the first, second inning, right? You know, it's it's very, very early. And I don't think we've quite hit the scale in these DAOs where these problems become apparent. Right now, it's very collaborative. We're not mm -hmm. at Dunbar's number. We're not we're not at a point where it's going to break. At least most of these DAOs aren't. Um, but I expect we'll hit that in the next couple of years for sure. I spent a couple of months on a, went back in my freelancer days, but I spent a couple of months with this company in the crypto space that's actually trying to transition into a DAO model. Um, and I mean, it is so hard to do because when you actually think about, so obviously DAOs can be formed or it can be transitioned into, right? And I think a lot of crypto companies have this overarching goal of like, one day we will transition into a DAO. But it's a huge open question of like, how that's even going to look. Like, when do you even fully make that transition? Like, that's so messy, People honestly. I positions think in, of power have to like decide to step down. Exactly. Like, you know, and then who to include and then who's even trying to decide who you're allowed to include or not. And I think that, you know, we're talking about all the amazing, I think, like the long term vision of like what DAO can enable, but the structural day to day is still tr super hard to really nail down. I'd actually love to throw it on you, too. Have you seen any great examples of this? Yeah, I'd say one of the best examples that I've seen is um, Index Co-op. And so mm -hmm. they've done a really great job of just making it super easy to contribute because they have very clear roles and responsibilities across many different um, committees, they've kind of introduced a little bit more hierarchy and it's not even really hierarchy. It's just structure, I would say. Um, but I think that they've done a great job and I've spent a little bit of time in that community and, um, just felt super excited by how much energy there was across the entire, you know, DAO ecosystem. Um, and I guess the one other thing that I would say is like, I don't know if a DAO is the right model for everyone. I think it's very, entrepreneurial. I think like if you want to join a DAO, you might need to be a little bit more comfortable, at least today with ambiguity. I think be a little bit more comfortable with taking some proactive measures to sort of creating whatever it is that you want to create. Like I think over time this will become easier, but today joining a DAO, I think requires a certain mindset that's more akin to being a freelancer um, or a consultant, like kind of having your own little um, company or something. Maybe a, a good question to wrap things up on. What do you think the world will look like in five to 10 years for DAOs? Here's maybe a couple of things that I, I hope the future looks like. And I don't know necessarily if we're going to get there hundred percent, but um, I think that DAOs are going to just change what it means for groups to coordinate and allocate capital. And so I think in five years, we are going to have DAOs that are allocating billions of dollars. And hopefully some of that goes towards public goods funding and um, really just like the funding of causes that I think today are potentially going through like government um, agencies and, and just feeling a little bit more like they need some life breathed into them. And I think DAOs are a great tool for that. 
And then I think the other thing that I would say is I hope that we have um, kind of redefined what success for a DAO looks like. Cause I don't necessarily think that every DAO needs to have, you know, thousands and thousands of contributors, but I think what it really needs to do well is coordinate. And so what does coordination look like? What models have we developed? Um, and how does that like, you know, hopefully blossom like many, many, many more DAOs is some of the problems that I hope we kind of solve in the next few years. Yeah, I'm also really excited to see how it changes the, f- the future of work. Like when we talk about the future of work, what does that look like with yeah. DAOs in the play now? And what does that mean for everyone's relationship with work? Um, I think that for me is very exciting yeah. as well. I'll, I'll throw one wild card in there that we didn't touch on. But I think over the course of five to 10 years, we'll see what it looks like to have AI as members of DAOs. Oh. What does it look like when we start to combine humans and machines? Are we creating Skynet? I don't know. Hopefully not. But I like it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's a whole can yeah, of worms. A whole can Let's of worms. revisit yeah. that in five years. <laughs> we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kindle, for taking the time to talk to us about DAOs today. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. Thank you for having me. What did we learn today and what do we still need to figure out? Whew. I, le- I, le- I learned that DAOs are very early. Yes. There's a lot of tooling that exists today, but it's yeah. still challenging to be involved. There's still a lot of like, kind of bumps in the road. Um, I'm just impressed a little bit more at how uh, I think that this is the future of work, right? Mm-hmm. This is a new way for humans to kind of collaborate with each other, find meaningful, passionate work. You don't have to line up the single corporation anymore. The nine to five model is outdated, as you talked about. And like, yeah, there's going to be some bumps in the road and some challenges, but DAOs offer a new alternative to meaningfully put yourself behind the, the, the causes and passions you care about. I mean, but that's the beauty of everything in crypto. It's messy, it's a little yeah. chaotic, but you find the fun and enjoyment in the messy and chaotic. It's um... innovative and it's disruptive, <laughs> and it's but it's chaotic and oh my gosh, but that's what's so exciting about it. It yeah. tickles me a lot. Yeah. yeah. Well, we want to keep the conversation going. Uh, love to hear your thoughts on DAOs. What questions did we miss? What points are still left unsaid? Um, let us know your thoughts. Reach out to us on Twitter, leave us a comment on YouTube. We also have a landing page at coinbase.com slash around the block, where not only you can find our episodes, but we also have long form research that's dedicated to our topics. So don't forget to check that out. So tune in next week. Today's conversation is for informational purposes only and does not constitute legal or investment advice. Actual results may vary materially from any forward-looking statements made and are subject to risks and uncertainties. 